Okay, everybody. Well, it's uh, pretty much two o'clock now. That's the time we said we would start our afternoon lecture. So we'll, we'll do that right now. I hope, you're, hope you can all hear me. Uh, some of you I can see, uh, some familiar faces, and also quite a few of you just coming in um, on, on audio or you haven't put your cameras on, and that's fine, whatever you're most comfortable with. Um, uh, it's really nice to, uh, to be back uh, with this afternoon lecture. I know probably quite a few people are away on holiday and doing different things. I've just come back from uh, two and a half weeks of annual leave, so if you're saying, Alex, you're looking particularly happy, then I am. So lovely to be back. And not only am I back, I'm back in the presence of Jerry Cohen, who will be our keynote speaker this afternoon. So that's a kind of win-win in every possible sense. So uh, just before I introduce a little bit more about Jerry and introduce uh, the, the theme today, um, I'd like to just uh, go through some CMJ notices. Um, and John's going to uh, share the screen here. So these are some of our upcoming events. We're just going to run through these uh, quickly. So um, um, the first slide, please, John. This is the one about the, uh, the Poland outreach, isn't it? Next slide. So can we go to next slide? Got the upcoming notices, events, and the, I, I can see the slides on the left hand side. I can't see them on the big screen at the moment. Um, uh, can I go? Don't worry, if we can't see the screen, I, I, I'll just read through the notices because I've I got them all here in front of me. That's, that should be fine. So that's the first. Ah, here we are. There we are. All good things come to those who wait. Um, so the first thing really here is is um, the, sp the prayer meeting. Some of you will be regular at this. Every fourth Wednesday of the month, we have our CMJ prayer meeting. And that's been a real kind of plus uh, in, in this COVID context. That's when we started meeting online. And we've had up to 70, 80 people praying for the work of CMJ on, on a monthly basis, which is, which is great. But this time... It's a kind of a particular interesting twist to the prayer meeting that we will be Zooming in live to join the team who are involved in the outreach in Poland. Uh, Paul and Janie will be hosting that, and uh, that's half past six um, Wednesday, the fourth Wednesday oh. of the month on the 24th of August. I just want to say really about the Poland outreach. I think this, I think this is such a significant piece of uh, missionary work, really. Um, I'm actually flying out to Poland on the 18th of August, and all together there's seven of us from the UK, but the team, which includes um, mainly people from Israel, both uh, Jewish believers and Gentile believers, a, a good group from America, and also um, a few from Europe, and also many local Christians from, from Warsaw and surrounding areas. So it's a quite a kind of a mixed team of people but we're all united in our love of Jesus and wanted to share him in the context of Poland, particularly the context of Warsaw. And of course, uh, Warsaw was the center of the Orthodox Jewish world in many ways, you know, pre uh, the Holocaust. And so it's a very moving, very testing, very sensitive, and also, I would argue, very important work. So your prayers on the 24th of August will be really, really important for that meeting. So do join us on that meeting. Okay, the next special event uh, takes place um, a couple of uh, weeks later, that's on Wednesday the 14th of September. Twice a year we have a special kind of teaching evening, celebration evening, teaching evening, and uh, this this time it's a special guest speaker. Um, some of you will know uh, the author, Amy or Ewing, and uh, she'll be speaking to us at the Shofar meeting. Originally, the chauffeur meeting was going to take place live in the local church within the sort of Nottinghamshire area. But it's always been online, and do join us on that evening. Um, there's still opportunities to book onto the Pilgrim Fathers Tour. Uh, they've been led by one of my colleagues, 
uh, Jane Moxham with her husband Chris, so they're, they're involved in that. And again, if you want to go, it's not too late, uh, do please uh, book into that if you're interested. Okay, following the Pilgrim's Fathers tour, we have another tour, this time a tour of Israel, which is the Cheese and Wine Tour of Israel. And those dates are available. Now, this tour has been cancelled, I think, three times uh, because of COVID and all the complications around that. But it's definitely going ahead, he said, on the uh, 14th of November. Uh, you'll be in very safe hands. Uh, Danny and Paul Haynes will be leading that tour. And uh, if you like Israel, if you like cheese and you like wine, maybe this is a little taste of heaven for you. If you want to commit to the cheese and wine tour, that's on uh, the 14th of November to the 22nd of November. So just finishing off now, we've got a few other slides which talks about how you can sign up for our weekly uh, news update. There's a um, QR code you can scan. Appearing on the screen, I think, after this one. Uh, you can also, in addition to the, uh, the newsletter, you can also make a gift to CMJ. I always felt in ministry there's three things which are important to make sure ministry happens. Number one, prayer. Number two, people. Number three, money. Those three things are sort of the kind of, the, you know, the, the, the different forces which are at work in order to make ministry effective. Do nothing without those three things, prayer, people, and sources, money. So you can donate if you so choose. And also you can stay connected with CMJ. And there are numerous ways you can do that. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, uh, our own website. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, write to us at Google Lodge as well. So those are some of the notices, but I do particularly want to just flag up those two first slides. That's the, the Poland Mission Prayer Meeting and then that special Shofar Meeting uh, uh, in, in September. So please, uh, I hope to see you or some of you at the, those meetings. Now, we come now to our, our lecture this, this afternoon. And... Um, and if you've been coming to these meetings regularly, we know we have a range of different speakers uh, looking at subjects which kind of connect in some way with the ministry of CMJ, uh, maybe historical, theological, contemporary issues. And we're just delighted today that our, our key speaker is, is Jerry, Jerry Cohen. Uh, Jerry, Jerry has a key role within the British Messianic Jewish Alliance. That's an organization we work very closely with. I know some of you listening to this will be members of the BMJA or, or associate members of, of the society. And that's really, really important. Um, and uh, Jerry was also with us at the conference, our CMJ conference this year. And he, he wrote a, lo a lovely blog about uh, the conference in the um, BMJA monthly blog. And he said some nice things about CMJ. So when he gets to heaven, you're gonna get a seat right near the front, which will be delightful. Um, but Joe is a really lovely guy, and we're looking forward to his, his teaching with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, Joe is going to speak for about 40, 45 minutes, and then there'll be an opportunity, we hope, for some Q&A. And I think the best way to do that, really, is if you've got a question or a question comes to your mind or a point you want clarifying, you stick it in the chat. I can look at all the chat, and then I'll kind of um, just uh, bring those different questions together uh, uh, and, uh, and we'll have a little bit of Q&A at the end. We'll be finished at three o'clock. Um, uh, I'm sorry, here at Eagle Lodge, we've got a lot of roadworks going on outside, so I'm sorry if there's any additional new, no, noise. I will put myself on mute. Um, it's also, I think, one of the hottest days in Nottingham, but we are not going to wilt. We are going to listen to Jerry, and we're going to get a lot of blessings from it. So I'm going to pray for Jerry now and then hand over to him. Okay. Father God, thank you for the 31 devices signed in today and for the people listening in, for those people engaging with the teaching. And Father God, when we hear teaching from your word and from your people, we know that we can be challenged and encouraged by that. So we just ask now for this, for this time together that your Holy Spirit will work in us and through us, that we'll be able to receive what you want us to receive. And we pray a special blessing on Jerry in his teaching ministry with us this afternoon. Please bless, encourage, and enrich him in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Mm -hmm. Harry, over to you, sir. 
I'm in for that. Oh, bless you. Thank you so much, Alex. I know that Alex is a man of faith. The reason I know that is because he hasn't read my notes. And he still prayed that it would be a blessing. And uh, you may or may not have heard me in other places. Uh, we've met, quite a few of us have met together uh, over various times, various places, various years. I've got folk from the congregation that I co-lead uh, in North London uh, sitting all around the, the Zoom room which is rather nice, but I'm sure there'll be folk I've not yet met, and I'm looking forward to, to further conversation. What I want to think about is stones, is building, is putting things into place. Um, that's sort of the general idea. And so I want to go back to um, even before I was born, 1897, just a little bit before I was born. And I'm sure you all would know about this, that the London Jews Society, and this may ring bells with you, they opened a hospital on a site outside the wall of the old city of Jerusalem. And that, of course, became the international, the Anglican International School. See, I've been doing my studies. I know what I'm talking about occasionally. And it was a time for building. It was a time, like Ecclesiastes said, a time to gather stones together. CMJ folks, you're brainy enough. You already knew that. You probably didn't have to do the research. But did you know that 1897 was the same year that Mark Twain wrote this on the Jews. If the statistics are right, the Jews constitute but about a quarter of 1% of the human race. A nebulous path of stardust lost in the blaze of the Milky Way. The Jew properly ought hardly to be heard of but he is heard of, and he's always been heard of. He is as prominent on the planet as any other people, and his importance is extravagantly out of proportion to the smallness of his build. Well, I don't think Mark Twain had met me, so the smallness of his build might not necessarily apply to me. But there we go. He talks about the finance, the medicine, the, the learning, literature, science, art, and music. The Jew, he says, survived all others. And he's done it with his hands tied behind his back. It's a curious way to talk about the Jewish people. That we survive with our hands tied behind his, our bum. And obviously, he's talking in a day before the rebuilding of Jerusalem, before the rebuilding of much that went on. What has that to do with us, though? This is not 1897. This is modern day. It's uh, 20, whatever it is on the calendar. But it's a distance. And what about that idea of, of gathering stones? Well, if you seen the film in the lift you'll know at the end of it there's this scene where the the people who portray folk in the film and some of the surviving people uh, go to uh oscar schindler's graveside and they they go and they put a stone on the grave in judaism we do this rather than put uh, flowers there because when you put a stone there, you're saying, I make a memorial, I remember. You think in the Hebrew scriptures of the time, when people would put a witness heap together, a set of stones that they would build up and say, may God watch between us. Now, it's usually a very lovey-dovey, you know, little two hearts, may God watch between us, you know, but actually it's May God just check up on us every now and then and make sure we're not doing the wrong thing. That's what that was about. So gathering stones together says we want God to watch what we do. However, we might be gathering them. Now, just to give you a little background about me, just in case you're wondering who this guy is. Well, 
I'm a teacher of religious studies in a secondary school in a sort of North London-ish area. Been doing that for quite a long time. I came to faith in Yeshua. If you were watching the uh, recording uh, that um, uh, Jane did uh, a few weeks back, uh, you'll know it's just on 50 years, just a little bit over 50 years since I came to faith. And since then, I think in a sense, I've been trying to build, I've been looking for ways to build up, to encourage Jew and Gentile together. At the end of last term at school, I challenged a lot of my students. I said, what would you put in a time capsule? What would you leave behind for other people? I said, you're not going to open that. Maybe your children will, if you have children, maybe grandchildren. And I, I came up with all sorts of ideas. And one of them just basically said, why can't we just put you in there? That make life a lot easier for us. That wasn't what I was planning. <laughs> if you think about it, if we were to put a time capsule in place, and maybe it would have some teachings for the future, maybe it have some scriptures, maybe it have some reminders of how God has worked, in our generation, or the next generation, I wonder if we think about the sense that God sets us in seasons and times. When he builds in our lives, when he places stones in our, in our place, when he sets us on foundations made by Yeshua, he sets us in dates and times. That's why we've got a sun and a moon and the stars. I'm not talking about astrology. I'm talking about something astronomical. Astronomical in the sense of really big. God gives us season to go through our lives. This helped our ancestors to regulate their life. The sun, moon, and the stars help us to mark our seasons and times. And recently, we had a time that was very serious. For those of you who were aware of the 9th of Av, which we kind of pushed over to the 10th because the 9th of Av this year was on Shabbat. And although it would have been a very serious day in the life of a Jewish person, we can't fast on Shabbat. So please God that every day would be Shabbat, but it doesn't work like that. We don't want you to be uninformed, says Rav Shaul, says Paul, about those who are asleep. Oh, I don't mean anybody in the, in the Zoom. I'm thinking about people who have passed away. It is right to grieve and is right to be sad at death. But we know that death's not the end. We know, as I mentioned, that when we go to a gravesite and we place a stone and we say, I remember the person who was there. We know that mortal rain remains will not take any place in the heavenness. We have a hope that goes beyond the grave. When we see destruction, when we hear of wars and rumors of wars that I'll speak about a little bit more, we don't fear. That's what Psalm 46 verse 2 says. We're not going to fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Job 11.15, you look up your face, you'll lift up your face without shame and you will stand firm. But you know something? It's not when the waters go around you, but it's when you walk through the waters. So it's okay if we have difficult times. It's okay in the sense that if, if God is building something in our life, and sometimes it needs those more difficult times, it's okay because he promises, I will be with you. I wonder if you know what a syllogism is. It's two unrelated things put together to make a third piece that is usually wrong. 
Here's a simple one. I have two legs. Each of you individually, you have two legs. So premise one, I have two legs. Premise two, you have two legs. Premise three, the table has four legs. Conclusion, we are a table. Doesn't really make sense, but you can hear things when you hear people preach and you go, they're stuck that there and they're stuck that there. Therefore, this is where they're going. I mean, it could have been worse. Cows have four legs as well. But let me tell you about a coincidence. And I mean coincidence because it's about my father and our family name. So here's another syllogism. Premise one. Many Jews lived in the East End of London in the 30s and 40s. Premise two, Hitler hated the Jews. Premise three, Hitler bombed the East End. Conclusion, the Blitz was caused by the Jews. Sounds crazy, no? Alan's shaking his head, wise man that he is. But let me tell you something. That thinking led to a huge amount of anti-Semitic action in the East End and beyond after the Second World War. In fact, in 1948, there was um, an action against Jewish businesses so similar to Kristallnacht, where people were smashing windows and uh, setting fire to Jewish businesses and Jewish homes in Britain in 1948. You'd think, but it's true. So my father, Sidney Cohen, goes to the bank in 1946. He wants to start a new business. He's got a really good idea. The bank wouldn't lend him money because he had a Jewish name. So he said, could I change my name and come back? And they said, of course. Um, no offence, but that would be fine. Well, my dad didn't go back to the bank, but he realised that it was coming up against quite a lot of anti-Jewish feeling. So he changed his name and he changed it to a very boring, dull name, Stone. Okay. I don't think he checked the Hebrew for that, but I will talk about that in a moment. But what man is there, Matthew 7, 9, who, if his son asks for bread, would give him a stone? Matthew 21, 42, talks about the stone that is rejected. Yeshua talks in Matthew 24 about the stones that will not even be left one on top of another. I was reading an article recently where archaeologists have been looking at the area around Jerusalem's walls and see where they've got these stones that were catapulted by the Romans. Some of them were sort of no bigger than a man's fist. Some of them are much, much bigger. And they were catapulted over to breach the walls. And they've worked out where the breaching of the walls has probably taken place first of all. That fascinates me because there's physical, scientific evidence of the way that the Romans did that. And by smashing down those walls and breaking down, it was a fulfillment of what Yeshua said. But what about those stones? The stones where they were standing when Yeshua would talk. Well, the word for father in Hebrew up. The word for son in Hebrew, ben. Put them together, you get a ben. And that is the name father, son, the Hebrew name for stone. So when my dad chose the name stone, what he may not have realized was he was linking the generations on, the father to the son. As believers, I think and I believe that we are built on the relationship that we have with the Son, Yeshua, 
and the Father. So if you're thinking about what is God building, Jew and Gentile together, what is God building when you come to pray? What is God building when we study the scriptures about Israel and about what we can do in this generation? The relationship through Yeshua to the Father. Because, of course, as, as he said himself, as, as Yeshua said, God is able of the stones around here to raise up children unto Abraham. In other words, there is a relational thing between the son and the father and the individual person that gives you the opportunity to be of the seed of Abraham. Hebrews 2.16 has been buzzing around in my head for months and months and months. And it says that God helps Abraham's descendants. Now, I'm not one who says Abraham's descendants are only the Jewish people. I think he's talking about those who live by faith. So we've got this father-son relationship, and it works with us. Now, why? Why does he want us to be built up? We're living in a time without the temple. Now, we know that because every time you go to Israel, people will tell you, oh, that's where the temple used to be. Or they might say, let, let me take you on a guided tour to where the temple isn't. It's a bit bizarre. And there's arguments about, oh, I'm not sure if it's there. Was it definitely by the Alaska Mosque? Is it slightly to the right? Is it slightly to the left? You know. When they're built, when they built in 1 Kings 5, 17, the king commanded, and they brought great stones. They brought costly stones to lay the foundation. They built them in heat. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, along come the Kohanim, along come the priests with their trumpets, with the Levites come along with the cymbals, and they come after to praise God in Ezra 3.10. Why are they praising God? Because God is building a foundation where he would dwell and where they would live. The problem was that there had already been one, and that hadn't lasted. I don't know about you, but I get the impression that uh, lots of people are saying, oh, if only, if only we had the third temple, wouldn't it be wonderful? Wouldn't it be tremendous? Quite a lot of people have asked me, Jerry, you're a Cohen. What about if you could be trained to take part in temple service? And I kind of think, well, hang on. Isn't that what I'm already doing? Because the temple is us. Don't you know that you collectively are a temple. Oh, am I still there? I don't know if I'm there. Oh, I don't know what happened. I disappeared, but I think you stayed where you were. Well, that's a good thing. Where was I? Oh, yeah, I was being a temple, and so are you. And I said, you know what? God has laid the foundation stones of the temple. Because he's put a great slab, a huge foundation stone. I'm sure you've been to churches and you've seen that lovely little stone that says, you know, this stone was laid by the mayor. I mean, my goodness, that must have been painful, but there we go. Or it might have said, in memory of or in honor of. And you think, that's, that's the foundation? No, it's not. A foundation stone goes right across the bedrock of where you're building. Yeshua is not stuck in a little corner somewhere and going, oh, isn't that pretty? He is the foundation. He is the bedrock from which we build, or God builds with it. In Revelation 21, 18, it says this, that the wall, the wall was made of diamond. The city 
of pure gold. The foundations of the walls were all kinds of precious stones, and it lists the diamonds and the sapphires, the antimonies, and all those things. It's lovely. Now, there were two uh, texts. One is Sefer Rezel Agadol, which, of course, you all know. When Jerusalem and the temple shall be built, they will be built of precious stones, pearls and sapphires, and every species of jewel. That is a very ancient text that Jewish people who study things about the temple would know. And how about this from Yalkut Rabbeini? When the Messiah, when the collected captivity, when the collected captivity shall come to the land of Israel, in that day the dead in Israel shall rise again. And in that day, the fiery walls of the city of Jerusalem shall descend from heaven. And in that day, the temple shall be built of jewels and pearls. I said fiery walls because this is what the Romans did. They set fire to the city. As I mentioned, we are people who set door by date and by times. There comes a point where in, uh, in our morning services on Shabbat, we read how beautiful are your tents, O Jacob. And that, of course, is part of a prophecy from Balak, who is not even a proper Jew. So he blesses, he blesses. Well, Balak, the king of Midian, um, gets um gets gets um gets Balaam to bless although he was expecting him to curse how lovely are your tents O jacob your dwelling places O israel as for me O god abounding in your grace i enter your house to worship wonderful and then we have this i see him but not yet a ruler that is to come. You see, if we really want to think, what can we do for the Jewish people? How can we speak to them? How can we build them up? We know the Messiah has come. We're sure of that. But, of course, many of our people question whether Yeshua was really the Messiah, because, after all, wasn't he supposed to build up peace? Wasn't he supposed to bring peace on the earth? Well, hmm. peace and yet a sword. It was according to God's will that Yeshua should be bruised and suffer. We know that. But that what would happen afterwards that he would build up, that he would see the travail of his soul, that he would see, that's you, that's you, that's each of you. You are part of the travail of his soul. We do and we will see destruction. We do and we will hear of wars and rumors of wars. But as I said, when you walk through the waters, they will not overwhelm you. You'd be forgiven for feeling caught up in the moment, in a sense, captivated by good news. Like, uh, like John in the Revelation, at once I was caught up in the spirit, and there before me a throne in heaven with someone sitting in it. Now, at this point, I could go through all sorts of scriptures about tribulation and revelation and desperation and annihilation and all sorts of things. And I'm not going to question whether it's pre or post or a or whatever. But there are times when things are going to be bad. And I might poke the hornet's nest a little bit here because I think that God's judgment upon the nations are secondary to the way he deals with Israel. 
And the reason I'm suggesting that is this. There will be, as Matthew 24, 9 says, there will be, the Greek says, ellipsis megale, which is basically great tribulation. In other words, there may be trouble ahead. So what are we going to do about that? How do we, as people who can see bad things on the horizon, but better things to come over the horizon, how do we witness truth of God's love to the people of Israel and to the Jewish people around us? Well, as I say, I think God's judgments on the nation are secondary to his dealings with Israel. And I think that's because we have a tremendous thing to tell Israel. God has said that Israel should be his wife. What does that mean? Well, Israel was adulterous. We know that. And if you look in Isaiah, particularly, and Hosea, you look at the way that God spoke to those to, to his people. And we know that uh, in uh, Hosea 2, particularly if you go from 14 to 23, you see adulterous, separated, divorced, punished, rejected, and abandoned all these things that refer to Israel. You can understand why some people in the church said, fine, let's just move them across and let's just step in because now God is going to bless us. That's not what we're talking about. Because on from there, there was a promise of forgiveness, of being cleansed, and of being restored. In Judaism, there's a ceremony called Bedeckin. It's the veiling over of the bride that she might be presented pure. Now, I don't want to confuse you because I've just talked about the wife. And of course, we talk about the bride of the Messiah, which is all believers. The veil, which is a symbol of marital status, in Isaiah 3.18, for women of station, or a covering with silk, as Ezekiel says in Ezekiel 16.20. In Judaism, the groom puts the veil onto the bride. It's never done if the groom isn't there. The groom set her aside and says, you are Kiddushin. That means you're holy, you're special. She is sanctified, and this means she's unapproachable for anybody else. In fact, if you were to take something into the temple or use something in the temple, if you were to carry something before it was used, you would veil it, you would wrap it round. I wonder if I've got a forest sitting in the mouth somewhere. Can you know where to do it? Um, no. That's, the Torah scrolls have got a wrap round them, and we call it a mantle rather like the high priest's mantle. And we have a belt round it, and you have even bells on top. It's rather lovely. When we carry the Torah scroll round the synagogue in procession, it's veiled until we receive the word. It's a symbol of purity and modesty. One day, if you look in Isaiah 25, verses 6 to 10, one day, we will look for the removal of the veil. We will also look for the removal of death, removal of tears, removal of disgrace, an end of reproach. In those scriptures in Isaiah 25, I love the fact that they mention wine twice. They want to be absolutely sure that you know it's going to be a good time. Many will come from the east and the west and will take their place at the feast with Abraham, with Isaac, with Yaakov. And uh, Alex Yaakov has already promised me a place at the front seat. That's I'm impressed with them. Thank you. But you're welcome to join me. And what are we going to do? Well, the main thing, we're just going to bless God. 
and we're going to be with Jew and Gentile who have come to faith. How does that help what we do for the Jewish people now? If we know where we're going, then we have a good idea of direction. Yeshua says, I am the way, Haderet. Okay? So when he talks about that, he says, come and let other people know. You'll hear a voice saying, this is the way. Hinei Haderet. Walk in it. How does that help us? Well, do you know what? We're building up. Now, there was a book some years ago. I mentioned it not long ago in our congregation, some years ago, and it was called Building with Bananas. And it was about the way that we, as, as people of God, with all our own foibles and all our own ways, are all part of the building that God makes. And trying to make a wall with bananas seems a bit odd. They're all kind of out of shape, and some are straight, and some are bent round, and some are a bit better than others. But God takes us as individuals, and he makes us into the building. He makes us into something very, very precious. Let's come back to that idea of stones. He who has an ear, Revelation 2, 17, let him hear what the Spirit says to the called out ones, to him overcome, I will give some of the hidden manna. There's one thing. I'll give him a white stone, and on the stone I'll write a new name. Now, do you remember what I said about my dad having a new name? But I'm not Jerry Stone. I was known as that when I was first born, but I changed my name. When I heard about what happened to my dad and to that history, I approached my mum, because my father had passed away, and I said, you know what I'm like with crazy ideas, but I don't quite think this is crazy. I'd like to change my name. I'm, by this time, I was in my, you know, whatever, umpteen years. And my mum listened to me and gave me a mother's look, and she said, well, you know, you are crazy, but this one I agree with. And I changed it. On the fifth, pretty well on the 50th year to the date, to the day. So that was a jubilee, a restoration of what had been taken for my family. But I know that I've got another name in heaven. I don't know what it is yet. A name that no one knows. The master of the household, if the slave agreed to remain, not only would you have that pouring through the air, but also the master would be willingly able to give the slave a stone and he would have the master's name engraved on that stone, which he would keep sometimes as a, around his neck or on his uh, wristband or something like that. And he would keep that saying, I identify with my master. As a Cohen, I have the most wonderful thing that I can do, which is to place the name of, is of Israel's God on the people of Israel, and of course on anyone who believes. Deuteronomy 6, 24 to 26, we know that. I'm sure you know that. Thus shall, uh, but we often miss the 27. Thus shall they put my name on the children of Israel. I don't know what your names are individually in heaven, but I do know that you've got God's name with you. When you speak to Jewish people, remind them, please remind them that they have the name of God. Being B'nai Yisrael, they're the children of God. God has not lost them. God has not hidden them away. God has not forgotten them. God has not turned his back. Look up. Look ahead. Look beyond and see what's God building. 
I'd love to hear from you folk. I'd love to hear what you've got to say. If you've managed to take anything in, something in, a lot of things in, or if you want to, oh, I'm not so sure about that, Jerry. But I'm, I'm going to, this is the usual miracle that I do. I stop talking. And uh, I'd love to hear you guys. So if you don't mind, um, go ahead. Well, thank you so much, Jerry. Um, that's, that's great. Thank you for, 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 that, for that input. 